you know, I had a very interesting day already today. Hello, Andrea. I had a very interesting day today because I, you know, I'm, I came from Sacramento and when I was in Sacramento on the train station, I noticed that I had forgotten my clipper card in the monastery. And then I called Diane and Diane you know, drove over to Richmond and met me because I'm, I'm not having any money or anything with me. So I wouldn't have been able to get over here. So then Diane came and bought me a clipper card and then we made it over here. And, and meanwhile, Noam and Karen had um, gotten some food. So we had, because we didn't have time anymore, you know, go anywhere to eat. So we all, we made it and it was everything different than what we originally thought, but it was also very good. And I just want to start by saying how much I appreciate, you know, your initiative with this place. It's very, very beautiful. And I have been uh, on sabbatical and I was in, in Berlin, actually, and met a nun who has made a, a center also in a, in a retail store. It was a bakery. And that I found that very inspiring, and that's also an idea I uh, I'm considering for the place I'm gonna do in Marin, if if I can find something along those lines or something different. But I think you know your place is really it is done with so much love and the colors. I really love the colors and beautiful. Yes, congratulations! And outside also very very beautiful how you made the windows and it's really great and and you know meditation is resilience i totally agree with that one you know it's very very um uh, you know it makes all of the difference i think you know to have that skill to have a little bit of a perspective or increasing perspective on what's happening i think it's crucial in these times where there's we are like with so much uncertainty you know yeah. So usually, you know, I'm starting um, at the beginning with a short introduction and then uh, the refugees and the precepts for those who'd like to. And you're going to screen share it. OK, so short introduction. My name is uh, Santa Chita Bikuni and I'm originally from Austria. As you can hear with my accent, and I started my whole Buddhist thing in Thailand in the uh, late eighties. My first teacher was Archon Buddha Dasa, forest monast um, master in the south of Thailand, and then I moved to England and trained uh, in the lineage of Archon Cha and Archon Sumedho for about almost twenty years before coming over here to San Francisco, two thousand nine, and where I was together invited with another nun to try you know, to set up a training monastery for nuns here in America. And we have been doing that for about 12 years and have just recently decided that we're going to call it a day because we haven't really attracted many strong candidates. But we didn't attract like a wildfire and have lost some of our buildings. And we feel like it's time to move on. And I'm in the process of moving back to urban area and I'm going to go to San Rafael. That's my intention. And yeah, and continue to come here to, to teach once a month. And my colleague, she's going to go on a sabbatical and she decides when she comes back what she's going to do next. And maybe some of you who are on our newsletter mailing list may have gotten the the news. And so, yeah. So that's a story. So that's like a, I'm also in the middle of a big shift. And yeah, and I think, you know, everything is easier with meditation, I think, you know, because we can get kind of more space around our experience. And if we get more space around our experience, we just don't take it also personally. And we can see, you know, laws of nature working and we can also gain some skill in directing all of that in a wholesome direction rather than getting, you know, carried away in a habitual way, going down always the same pathways. What's called neuroplasticity these days, you know, that's exactly what the Buddha took advantage of 2,500 years ago. And we can continue, you know, to benefit from his uh, genius, you know, that he was able to lay that down, you know, how that 
works in a way which is very pragmatic and still, you know, applicable today. And yeah, and, and I'm just going to try to share that here to the degree I can. Yeah, and I think, you know, the particular the precepts, the five precepts are like the foundation stone for if we want to go anywhere with our practice without the five precepts having it built on a foundation of the five precepts, it's not going to go anywhere very much, you know, and that doesn't mean that we don't slip and, you know, make mistakes and so on, but to just know that's the, that's the ideal, that's the guiding star, and we're going to look in that direction, and if we make a mistake, we're just going to start again, you know, again and again, and then there's also the three refuges, uh, which are like called the GPS, you know, of Buddhism, because they kind of remind you of what is really liberating and what is really um, of timeless value, you know, in this life as, as a human being. And does anybody, uh, you know, not know what, has anybody here never taken the, the refuges and the precepts? Because you know, you not have to do it right now if you never did it. I think you should think about it, you know, and not just jump into it like it's, you need to know what you're doing. And I don't want to spend like one and a half hours to explain it. But if there's a short question, then people could ask. Okay. And then I'm just gonna, we're just gonna start at, at Budang Saranangachami. And maybe you can mute everyone on the Zoom, no? And then we can just go through that together, you know? And for those who are here who want to do it, you can look on the screen. It's a bit far away for most people, I suppose, huh? But I know it's it's actually not so difficult, so you can just try, stumble along. You know, maybe yeah, that helps. Maybe we can do it call and response, and I do... I read it out first on my own, and then we can all read it together. And then we just go down like that, okay? Bhutang Sarananga Chami Bhutang Sarananga Chami Tamang Sarananga Chami Tamang Sarananga Chami Sankang Sarananga Chami Sankang Sarananga Chami Tutiampi Putang Sarananga Chami Dutiampi putang saranang gachami. Dutiampi tamang saranang gachami. Dutiampi tamang saranang gachami. Dutiampi sankang saranang Gachami Dutiampi Sankang Saranang Gachami Tatiampi Putang Saranang Gachami Tatiampi Putang Saranang Gachami Tatiampi tamang saranang gachami. Tatiampi tamang saranang gachami. Tatiampi sankang saranang gachami. Tatiampi sankang Saranang Gachami. Now we're going to do the five precepts. And again, and I'm just going to read it out once on my own. And then you can, you know, uh, repeat it together with me. I undertake the precept to refrain from taking the life of any living creature. I undertake the precept 
to refrain from taking the life of any living creature. I undertake the precept to refrain from taking that which is not given. I undertake the precept to refrain from that which is not given. I undertake the precept to refrain from sexual misconduct. I undertake the precept to refrain from sexual misconduct. I undertake the precept to refrain from false and harmful speech. I undertake the precept to refrain from false and harmful speech. I undertake the precept to refrain from consuming intoxicating drink and drugs, which lead to carelessness. I undertake the precept to refrain from consuming intoxicating drink and drugs, which lead to carelessness. Okay. So, and now I just want to use like a few minutes to arrive here in the location and also in the Zoom room. Just, you know, arriving here on your seat and feeling the body. And, you know, checking out, you know, how is your mind right now? How does it feel? And is it busy or is it spacious or is it contracted or is there some fear or some anxiety or some joy, you know, to see people again in person. And then the emotional state right now. And then, you know, coming to the body as it sits here on the chair, on the cushion. As you know, we're starting again to meet in person slowly and you know, as not many people yet, but we're knowing, you know, that somehow the tide is shifting and people are, you know, interested to come again and even we still have to wear masks. Retreats are happening again. You know, we are all coming, you know, back from like a few years of lots of kind of unusual time with lots of uh, turmoil and, and new challenges. And the Dhamma you know, is always the same. Whatever happens, if it's... Uh, you know, very intense or very relaxed. The Dhamma is always the Dhamma. So that hasn't changed. But maybe, you know, we feel a bit more need, you know, to, to make the practice more central in our lives now after all of what has happened and all of the uncertainty, you know, not knowing. Because in some way, you know, most of us know that we're not going to go back to how it was before, but we need to go forward into very uncertain times. Which at the same time are also a great opportunity, a great chance for innovation and for doing things differently than before. And, you know, basically bowing down to, to what life is showing us. 
And the Dhamma is, is such a versatile tool, you know, we can take along wherever we're going to help us to adjust and make some kind of sense out of this. And, and really, you know, kind of implementing it more in our lives than before. Because we, we see, you know, that's really the way it is. Things are changing, not only, you know, like thoughts in the mind or, you know, certain other things in our lives, the seasons or whatever. But, you know, things are like big, big um, perceptions are changing to like worldviews or cultures or, you know, like, social agreements and the ways how things have been done for such a long time, in particular in our relationship to to planet. And it's just not adequate. And it's just so obvious. And as you can read, you know, when you come into the center here, you can read, uh, meditation equals resilience, and that is so true. Not because, you know, it makes us more fortified, but because there's more fluidity. Through understanding, you know, of the Dhamma, it brings fluidity in our lives. And I think, you know, that's what I'd like to speak about today, about, uh, you know, that uh, life is all about movement. And, you know, if we are stuck in old ways of doing things, then, you know, it's like the water is frozen and it's like a block, you know, which is like frozen in time, frozen in the past. And there's this kind of feeling, you know, we can't risk to make any changes because it's, it's so much uncertainty and we, we can't do that. But then, you know, if we are frozen in the past, it takes a lot of energy, which keeps the freezing going. Like you have to plug in the freezer in order for it to freeze. It costs a lot of energy. And then every energy which is frozen in that freezer is also missing, you know, from our lives. So being stuck in the past, you know, if the present is demanding, you know, and, and really shouting at us to open up to change and to adapt, that's, you know, what the Dharma is really here for, to help us to recognize that and then to pay attention to particular features of our experience, which help us then, you know, to slowly but surely loosening up the whole thing. You know, bringing some movement in, bringing some air, bringing some buoyancy into our lives by, you know, looking at our experience in a very particular way. And this particular way is, uh, is called the Dhamma, which is a very pragmatic teaching. And it's like a toolbox, you know, where we can pull out the right tool for the right moment. And, and what's also very important, I think, is to not forget that it's not only about you know, using the teachings in order to 
cultivate the mind and then insights occur and through those insights you know our mind patterns get uh, more or less quickly you know uh, disentangled and they get loosened up more and more but what's really also important is to put it into practice to really leave it what we see in the meditation to really leave from that space so there's the realization which is in you know, our personal experience understood in the meditation that we say aha it's like this it really is you know for example impermanent we can really observe that in our own body and mind but then you know to actualize it by living accordingly that's what basically integrates that realization into our life and allows that realization you know, to spread out through our life so the first one you know would be more the wisdom aspect and in the pali uh, tradition it's called the panya and the other one is the more the faith aspect or sada. So both of them, you know, they need to work together. They strengthen each other. The more, you know, we have the capacity to really live from our realization, the more that realization gets integrated and we have more strength. And the mind becomes even more capable, you know, of uh, seeing how things are mutually dependent and conditioned and so one, you know, strengthens the other. And, you know, in, in a daily balance, that's sometimes called like walking your talk. You know, not saying something, but really doing it, but really living from that space. So I think that's very important if we want to continue to, you know, grow in capacity in our practice, have more and more uh, resilience, you know, not a, a resilience by not, you know, by being invulnerable, but it's a different kind of resilience by really being not afraid to be vulnerable. And through that capacity to really be vulnerable, we become ever more invulnerable because the vulnerability is is a fact, you know. But if we're afraid of that vulnerability, then it makes us very vulnerable. But if we can embrace the vulnerability for what it is, it makes us strong. It makes us resilient. And, uh, you know, so the really kind of the choices we make every day, that they be really informed by our practice and informed in particular by the five precepts, for example. And, uh, you know, having ever clearer priorities in our lives, what really is important to us. And then, you know, checking, has there been really, has there been some transformation? Has there been some changes, you know, in our lives and in our minds? You know, when we look in our minds and hearts, can we see, is there a difference, you know, in comparison how, you know, I would have, uh, dealt with a certain situation two years ago or three years ago and how what's happening right now can I see a difference I think that's really important to investigate in that way and you know and there's this gradual refinement of the mind by training the mind in uh, you know what's one of the early ways you know of the early buddhist ways of describing it is to train the seven factors of awakening in the mind that's a, a very handy list you know for checking on our mind mindfulness investigation of dhamma energy joy calmness stability of mind and equanimity so that's the seven factors of awakening and that seven qualities of the mind you know which are innate qualities of the mind and through the practice we can hone them you know we can refine them and then the mind gets ever more capable of going into the depths of experience and see what's happening 
and have more and more capacity for relationship. And capacity for relationship is a different word for resilience. It's the same thing, you know, not having to shut down in order to protect ourselves, but being being able to stay open. That doesn't mean, you know, that we are not making boundaries, making boundaries, but making those boundaries, uh, you know, with wisdom and compassion, not just like kind of shutting down because we are overwhelmed. So, so, you know, the more we are able to leave from that place of what we experience for ourselves in our practice, the more coherence there is, you know, between our life and our practice. The more we are in alignment or attuned like that, the more we will be able, you know, to stay in relationship with our environment, with our communities, you know, with our family, with our friends. So we, we can just like really be fully there and uh, and can tap, you know, more and more into that inner, inner intelligence of, of life itself or nature itself. You know, if we are be able to stay open and don't have to disconnect because we feel like we can't we can't handle it basically because there's still too much uh, need you know for control and too much fear and and so on you know and through the practice we we are more and more like loosening up those patterns and through this loosening up and creating more space we have more space for life, you know, to be what it is. And I really like that example of called ABC, a bigger container, you know, our whole being, our mind, our bodies, our presence, you know, has more and more capacity, more and more resilience, that more and more of life as it is fits in. We don't need to defend. We can let it be what it is. And we can stay connected, we can stay in relationship, and we can learn from it, you know. And uh, I think, you know, because of the many, many things which have happened over the last few years, you know, and also the whole outlook we have on the climate crisis and the understanding, I know that there's lots of things which are, taking you know place which are rather unpredictable that I, re I really feel you know that the only way how we can get some kind of a handle on it is if we really stay in relationship with what's happening and not turning away into distraction and just you know taking on the challenge of that shift you know that it's yes yeah, so many many people you know, uh, realizing that there is really something different now starting to become more and more apparent. And it's not only, you know, like a bad thing. There's also like what's called like an emergent understanding, you know, an emergent way of receiving that information which is coming through to us as you know as uh, what the planet is basically for example telling us you know with all of the things which are going on there is already a very loud message in all of this and the message is you know we need to uh, understand you know that we are not separate we are not separate from planet earth we are we are it as actually, you know, we are just like planet Earth walking around basically. And we are in constant exchange, you know, we never cut the umbilical cord to the planet and we are constantly, you know, eating planet and drinking it, breathing it. We are just like a process and part of a much bigger process 
in 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 inside of you know uh, cosmos, which is the vastest of of processes. You know, we really cannot understand with the mind, but we can. You know, through training our minds, we can, in an intuitive level, get kind of a understanding of that process nature of all of this, the constant flow, the constant change, the fluidity, and we can, through practice, you know, become more and more fluid ourselves. So we understand ourselves more and more as part of this and not separate not, you know, like separate entities in a hostile universe, but we start to feel ourselves as being part of this whole process. And there's a sense of enrichment and, and a sense of safety, you know, which comes from that dissolution of this separateness, which is just a result, you know, of... Uh, not understanding the way things truly are. And that resilience, you know, which is written here at the entrance door, that, res that true resilience comes from understanding that we are not separate from planet Earth. And that at this time, you know, people like us who are like, you know, interested in having a practice, we are really in particular in a cold, you know, to wake up to that opportunity we have. That we, you know, we can become the immune system of this planet by, you know, preparing ourselves to stay in relationship with what is going on and listening into that innate intelligence of that whole process, you know, which you can uh, kind of imagine, you know, as a very, very faint whisper, which is coming out of the silence, you know, which is not ending at the walls of this room, but the silence permeates the whole universe. Or you know, in the Buddha's uh, teaching, sometimes it's called like the Dhammakaya in the Tibetan teaching or Prajna Paramita in the uh, Mahayana teaching or awareness. There's so many different ways, you know, how that empty knowing can be called. And all of those different names, you know, they have limitations. They are not what it really is, but we can experience it in the meditation. And just, you know, honing the mind by training, you know, those seven factors of awakening so that we can hear this very faint whisper, which, you know, all other sounds in this room right now, you know, the sound of the the ventilator which is going in the background and maybe some sounds on the street outside or maybe the sounds in your body, they are all coming out of that silence which is behind the sounds. So, you know, if we are listening in that way, you know, to this very, very faint whisper, like if you're listening to music, you know, which is like turned down very, very, uh, very, very faint sound, you have to kind of not straining, but listening out. And that's like a way to open the mind.
you know, whenever the mind is, is capable to really stay open like that and not, you know, contracting around me and my, what I want and what I need and what I'm afraid of and what I, what I'm, you know, what I'm worried about, all of those things, whenever that comes up to just let it be and coming back to that listening. And through that, you know, learning that we don't need to, you know, kind of drown in our, in the patterns of our mind. We do have a choice. We can, at least, you know, when we remember it, we can step out of those patterns and we can start to observe them, we can start to become conscious of those patterns. And then what we start to see first is they are all impermanent. They are just, you know, constantly changing. And that, you know, seeing that is a very, very crucial insight, seeing the constant changingness of everything and rather than trying to nail anything of this down, just being more in the position of the one, you know, who observes all of that. At least, you know, at those times when we can, when, when they are not too seductive or too scary, that we can stay outside and we can stay an observer. That's a very, very important skill, you know, which can help very much with, you know, making us more resilient, making us more capable of keeping a perspective on what is happening. And, you know, first in the, in the beginning of the practice, we might only be able to remember that when the you know, when the weather is, is quite uh, mild, you know, but then through practice and through increased resilience, we can stay conscious for more and more challenging things, you know. More and more challenging opportunities. And we can abstain, you know, from interfering out of, fear you know we can we can just keep an open mind and see what happens and i think that's also you know, what is meant with resilience to to uh, not interfere too quickly these knee-jerk reactions you know out of fear to just make it make it go away because we don't have the capacity to keep an open mind because we are again and again projecting the past onto the present and then it becomes the future but if we can you know refrain from interfering and just let it take its course until we know what is a skillful response That's you know what is meant with really bringing the practice into our lives and uh, this intertwining process between realization or insight and actualization and putting it into practice and how those two how they work together and how they strengthen each other. And, you know, and how that sometimes means, you know, we have to give up some kind of a comfort. What we thought was a very comfortable solution, we need to look if that is really true in the big picture. Because the greatest comfort, you know, which we can accumulate for ourselves is that resilience, really, which isn't dependent on physical comfort. This is much more 
protection, much more safety, you know, to be more independent from comfort. And, uh, you know, through that consideration to save energy, literally, you know, to save energy, to maybe don't have to have all of this stuff or much less of it. Save a lot of time with that. Then we have more time for practice. And then if you really practice well, you know, that will automatically lead to more resilience. And then if there's more resilience, we need less comfort. And it's like, it's a powerful process, you know, and the Dhamma is, you know, in those different ancient chants, which we are also having at the monastery, there's the Dhamma is, is uh, qualified with, with different um, adjectives, you know, and, and one of the, those adjectives is the Dhamma is opanaiko, which means, if we, we translate it into English, means leading onwards. Leading onwards in the sense, you know, that if we really leave from that place, you know, what we know to be true, the Dhamma will take care, you know, to guide us towards ever more conducive circumstances for practice. If we really leave from that place, this is just like an innate kind of uh, quality of the Dhamma, this open icon. And that can, you know, sometimes be pretty amazing what can, which doors can open. And I think it's really also good, you know, to reflect back onto our lives as individuals and see, you know, has that happened? Has that happened in your life? You know, that your aspirations and uh, you know, motivation, why we are practicing and why we are living in this way, that it really has the power to open doors. And I see that also, you know, in a much bigger context now in this time where there's so much uncertainty for us, you know, as a, as a species, we have messed up a lot. More and more people waking up to that. And there's a lot of fear of not, you know, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. Even, you know, there is so many people who are already wanting to do things differently, but there's still, you know, that feeling of helplessness, like, you know, a child which there's the father figure is suddenly no longer here, you know, and we all have been deeply conditioned in this culture, you know, to there's this man, this older man, these father figures who are fixing everything for us, but they, they're not up to the job. And now we are we are not having those anymore. And what we're we going to do? Now we have to grow up. We have to grow up. And one way of growing up is to be really in relationship with what's happening, because then you just need to grow up. Just need to quickly grow up. And I think, you know, this practice is, is a support for that, you know, because it shows us different ways, you know, how we can increase this capacity for relationship with ourselves, first of all, with our own mind states and feeling tones and everything with our own experience. And then if we can do that with ourselves, we can do it with others, we can do it with everything you know with nature and we can more and more realize hey you know we are actually part of nature we are not just like walking around in nature and taking some of this and not wanting that no it's not like that we are we are intricate part of it and that's all only you know really being becoming you know a, a, a knowing through relationship so relationship is the medicine and to see what stands in the way of relationship is the practice. And you know, the Buddhist teaching is, is a template, is a very good 
you know, set of instructions, how we can see more and more what stands in the way. And if we can then, you know, really open to that and relate to that, we can melt that, you know, through insight, through compassion, and through all of the different practices and all of the schools of Buddhism. They're all about that, you know, whatever school it is, they might look vastly different, but the essence of the practice is always the same. It's letting go of past patterns of interpreting our experience and have more and more direct capacity for experience, which can also be called resilience. You not have to shut down, not have to go and defend myself. And uh, yeah, I think that's, that's uh, you know, in a nutshell, you know, how we can describe um, what the practice is all about. And now I'd just like to follow up with a guided meditation, give us a little bit of a direct experience of that. And, uh, you know, that the core remedy for dissolving, you know, those very tenacious patterns is being capable to be in relationship with our experience. And then once that has been, you know, cultivated to a certain degree, then that capacity for relationship, which can also be named resilience, to use that and relate to the world, you know, relate to the climate crisis, relate to everything from a position of openness, which knows, you know, we don't have to fix that on our own. That's impossible. But we can, you know, take advantage of the tools we've got, you know, this body and mind. We can kind of get them into shape for what they are meant to be, you know, because they are like, um, they are containers to receive information. They're like biocomputers, you could also say, you know, and they have to be tuned up so that they are, because they are so, so much like uh, programs, you know, which need to be deleted really. And clear, clear, make some, make some updates. And first, we need to make some space so some updates can be received. And I think, you know, if we can see it that way, it's not so difficult because then it's more about okay, you know, we have to um, get some movement going here and make some spring cleaning or something. Make some space for that which wants to be understood that it has a place to land and uh, you know those seven factors of awakening if we can focus on that it's a pretty simple list and I can just maybe try and give a little guided meditation on that so just sitting and uh, you know becoming aware of the breathing process bringing some you know, mindfulness to the breathing process, that's already the first factor of awakening, sati or mindfulness. And then, you know, if we are taking some interest in our breathing process, then that's already the second factor of awakening, which is uh, Dhamma Vichaya, Dhammavichaya or interest investigation of Dhammas to really, you know, have opening to the experience. And then in order to stay with that experience, that needs some energy. That's the third factor of awakening, energy or virya. So already the first three factors of awakening are already there. You know, you need them even to put a key in a keyhole, really. So those qualities, they are not like super outlandish or anything. They are 
rudimentary in everyone's mind who has ever done anything. So and they just can be, they can be more and more refined and through this refinement become more powerful, greater capacity to discern. So the first, the first three, and then, you know, if we are basically in the process, really being with our experience, that brings a sense of contentment or even some subtle joy, you know, not wanting to be somewhere else, really being here. And that's the fourth factor of awakening joy or pity in Pali. So joy is a very important factor in the practice, gives it some, you know, buoyancy, some spaciousness. Without joy, insight isn't really coming forth. And this is not a joy, you know, which is derived from sensual pleasures, but it's, it's called a non-worldly joy, which comes from just being content with the present, not wanting to be somewhere else. And then if we can, you know, stay with our experience in that way, then the whole system starts to calm down. That's the fifth factor of awakening. That's uh, Pasadi in Pali. Because the mind feels enriched, it just calms down. Because it's no longer leaning into anywhere. It just is here. It has arrived. And it there's a stability, a collectedness arising, which is the next factor of awakening, which is uh, samadhi. And then, last but not least, <coughs> upeka or equanimity. Equanimity towards our own mind states. You know, the mind we can see the mind is sometimes is stressed, is contracted, is greedy or whatever, but we can have a sense of equanimity with all of that because we don't take it so personal. <coughs> so that's the seven factors of awakening. And the mind, you know, is spacious, balanced, stable. And then we can listen into that spaciousness, listen into the silence. Which, which doesn't end at the walls of this room. The immeasurable emptiness. which is also knowing, knows about the sounds, feeling the touch of the chair of the cushion, it's an empty knowing. It's like an effortless knowing, which isn't, we don't have to make it happen. It, it just is. It's like a mirror. 
or like a surface of a, a lake, reflecting the mountains around the lake. And at the same time, you're know, seeing into the, under the bottom of the lake that clarity. So that innate intelligence of uh, emptiness. Or empty awareness. And just being receptive and attuned to that. like sitting in it. And that, you know, that intelligence which speaks like a faint whisper. the silence. And at the same time, you know, we're also aware of our body. And, you know, we can bring up, bring up a social issue in our lives, in our culture, in our community, in our family, it's just some kind of an issue maybe even a real hot issue, like whatever climate crisis. And, you know, and to just let that, you know, come forth and not judging it, you know. Just whatever it is, let that arise. Some kind of a divide, you know, racism, you know, in this culture is a very big issue. For example, and so how do I relate to that issue, this particular symptom in this cultural body of uh, the West Coast of America? How do I relate to that? What does it bring up in me without immediately charging it? So just relating to the issue in a, in a different way than usual, just with this very subtle attunement, just allowing it to be there and see. You know, approaching it with curiosity and with spaciousness. not with preformed ideas, not judging it. And, you know, and holding it with this more much open mind and wanting to see what's the underlying roots of that issue. Climate crisis or racism or whatever it is. What's the underlying roots? Without judging, just seeing what's the roots. You know, and in the Buddhist dispensation, the three root poisons are called greed, hatred, and delusion. So in some way or another, we can always, you know, Everything can be brought back to those three roots.
And what's happening, you know, if we are seeing that? Do we feel, you know, do we want to check out and think about something else? Or do we get really tired or get kind of confused or excited or fearful? What's happening? Or do we get interested? Aha. Uh -huh. Interesting, you know, how much uh, social absenting is happening, that there's, it's possible that a whole global society can be with these huge issues and not make much progress for such a long time. Dragging it out since a long time. And now it's getting tighter and tighter, everything. And suddenly, you know, there's more, more interest, really, because we can see we can't get away from it. We need to relate to it. And just seeing, you know, how does my particular body and mind relate to that issue? Is there some interest or is there a sense of, I just want to do something else. I just don't want to <coughs> relate to this. Just noticing it. That's enough. There's nothing we need to do. Just being aware. And seeing the whole, you know, the intergenerational trauma patterns, the collective patterns of trauma, which, you know, we have also inherited from our culture, from our family, from our ancestors, all of that, and also all of the resilience, which they have been cultivating, you know, over the deep time. And through, you know, cultivating those seven factors of awakening, we can see all of this. And at the same time, we can also understand this is impermanent. This is unsatisfactory and not self. Just seeing, you know, how we are part of this vast web and, you know, a lot of it has been handed down to us and what we can do is, is to work on how we're relating to all of this. Are we are just like by road, you know, repeating, repeating, and repeating, or are we uh, bringing in some perspective? Because that's, we can do that. That's a choice we can make, and we have the tools for it. It's like, you know, the the gap through which the light can come in. 
and it makes all of the difference. You know, a, a room which has been in darkness for 100,000 years, if the window is open just for one second, we have seen it at least once, it's never going to be the same again. And then repeating that seeing, that's what's needed. And that all is going to feed into the collective culture as well. We are not separate. So in many ways, we are using a practice which is comes from Iron Age India. It's very old, 2,500 years old. And the, you know, the components of the human mind, they are always the same. But the, the situation now, in terms of sense of urgency, has changed. But then at the same time, you know, we have so much more resources. We can do these hybrid meetings here, for example. That is amazing. So seeing, you know, how this... Uh, issue can be seen you know, from the roots and then we can see you know those root causes how they're also operating in us you know physically and emotionally mentally relationally So, you know, how, how are we absent, you know, to what's happening? How are we also contributing to these issues? And how can we start you know, to be more present to that in ourselves? But just seeing you know, the defense mechanisms. And that seeing is, is, is so important. And then just dropping that and then you know, coming back to just the body, sitting and, and breathing. Just seeing, you know, what's the, the after effect of this exercise, what do you notice? Just, you know, coming back again to the, the space and the silence. And just inviting any kind of uh, download, you know, of uh, this innate intelligence. Any innovation, any 
update, any new way of seeing and responding. If there is anything which can arise in that empty space, let that become known. And then you're really living from that place. Again, you know, that which is understood to kind of put it into practice, to live accordingly. And so that, you know, encouraging that flow, encouraging that fluidity, the movement, of this, you know, essential teaching, which is so ancient, but then it's always again expressed in new ways. So to allow that you know, innate intelligence to become in formation, to come into our formation, our bodies, our minds, and then living from that place. If we have more, you know, kind of courage and uh, faith in that. And that can only come from exercising the capacities, which means you're not know, doing it and uh, frequently. And you know, making oneself really available for that. So now I'm going to soon ring the bell. We have a few more minutes left. If anybody would like to you know, ask something or clarify something of what I said. This is more of a curiosity. Um, but I was really hearing and deeper appreciating their talk about the seven factors of awakening. Is that the right word? Mm -hmm. It was making me think about the, uh, the, the writings that I have just been reading about from some of not fun about the mm -hmm. that awareness. Um, I think there were like a few lessons and like, I can't remember exactly how it was, but it was like acknowledging the breath or the essence of the past. Like breathing in, I know I'm alive. I'm mm -hmm. was also like thinking about the mm -hmm. I was just, it was interesting because I had read that just before I came in. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering about the, and I wonder if they're, like if they have a relationship to each other, that feature that she has on doing. Um, and the, the, you know, the suttas, they all, they are like, just, I think, because Dignatan, you know, is a, is a teacher in the, in the Mahayana tradition. So the suttas are just like, they are the same, you know, just maybe differently expressed. And 
and the breathing is more like you know it's we we can use different meditation objects and breathing is one of them you know as a as a, as a kind of an as it's said you know meditation object to focus the mind on you know and it can be it can be a mantra it can be the breath can you wear your mask mm -hmm. can be the mantra can be the breath can be a visualization you know there's so many different ways you know but it's it's to have something to come back to again and again and then the mind gets lost in something come back to the breath mind gets lost you come back it's a constant you know letting go and coming back to the object and then the additional, you know, maybe benefit with the breath is that you can also talk about it in the way Thich Nhat Hanh speaks, you know, because without breathing, we are dead, you know. And also, you know, the breathing also brings to mind, you know, the exchange which happens between the, the trees and, and, and us humans and, and that whole, you know, interbeing. He speaks a lot about that, you know, this inter or intra connection between all of life, you know, and that there is no really separate entities, but it's it's a huge process, you know, everything depends on or leans on everything else. So yeah, it's it's basically and it's an insight into emptiness, you know, that everything is empty of a uh, independent self, but everything leans on everything else. And and the breath, you know, because it's a rather subtle object, so you have to really stay with it in order to experience it so that would hone you know those seven factors of awakening because it's like a way to sensitize the mind and if you pay attention to something which is very subtle you know the mind gets really strong so it's not like in the gym you know the more heavy the things are we lift the more muscles we get but with the mind is the more subtle we pay attention to the more subtle the object is the more powerful the mind becomes does it make sense? And the breath is a particular, you know, it's an object which he said, you know, is suitable for anybody. And, and the Buddha himself is on record to have used that meditation, Anapanasati, mindfulness with breathing in and breathing out. So, yeah. I, I, it was interesting coming in, you know, I'm thinking, right? There's a part of me that starts thinking, you know. Mm -hmm. you know Yes. So it was just interesting because they were just sitting right next to each other and they were talking about the human brain process. Mm -hmm. and kind of mm-hmm. Yeah. And then you know, if you can pay attention to the subtle breathing in a the meditation, then there's much more likelihood, you know, when you go out into your life and there's things happening if the mind has the capacity, you know, to 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 discern subtleness, then it can also discern other things, you know. And suddenly, you know, there are certain things you have been doing, you can't do it anymore because the the mind is is suddenly recognizing certain things. It didn't recognize it before, you know. And then something you could do maybe two years ago, like you just throw your thing out of the window, you know, from the car, Suddenly, you would like to do it. You, you can't do it anymore because you start you start suddenly making the connection. Well, uh, if I do that, you know, then that, that and no, no, I'm not gonna do. And it's not something you have to make a decision. You just can't do it anymore because your circle of concern has increased. You know, because you understand that you are not separate from. You know, you could as well kind of eat it up that piece of plastic, and you don't want that. So. And that's, that's, you know, if one starts to have experiences like that, that's really kind of quite amazing, you know, because then you see how the practice works, you know. And then you want to pay attention to that, you know. And then if the mind is, is has that strength that it can recognize subtle perceptions, you know, that it has that precision, you know, then... You could say, you know, precision is a is a is a kind of laugh, you know. That that it can really so tune in, you know. So yeah. So if it would that like anybody else wanna say something or 
comment something or if not that's fine too that's very beautiful those eight auspicious symbols yeah beautiful <laughs> and the Sumis, do you want to say something? <laughs> no. Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. I just you want to comment on the thing. I really love the. Uh... I love the awakening factors, so those are really nice to hear. Mm -hmm. Also, um, the health, like climate change and so forth, if we felt in this body, I thought was interesting. I had no maybe done that. And so it was, yeah, I was really curious how I did want to just grab them. I was like, okay, what if I don't want to grab them? Yeah. <laughs> but that's, you know, it's just enough to know that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then it'd be good to ask, you know, where's that coming from? Is is it because you think you have to do it all yourself? Yeah, but this is yeah. I know what to do, I know what to do, but then you know it's really good to go there and and number one is you don't have to do it all by yourself, you know. But it can just be, you know, that then you feel, you know, we are triggered, you know, and and then just being with that. Yeah. Because that's, you know, that's at the root of the inability, I think, you know, to really relate to everything is the traumas, you know, which get triggered. And But if we're just going to stop here, then we're going to keep on kind of like, you know, kind of cycling in the same thing. So we need to develop some skillful means to, to slowly dissolve those traumas, you know. But you can't go with the sledgehammer, but awareness, you know, and and allowing it to be there and having community and and all of that, you know, can help us to slowly dissolve the trauma because it's just a frozen response, you know, which was once a very skillful response when we were small because we didn't have much choice, you know. But if we now still enact the same trauma into towards, you know, for example, big issues like climate change, we still fall in that same hopelessness and helplessness when we were five years old. That just doesn't cut it, you know. I mean, that just, we can't stay there. And, and that's what I, I wanted to do that, you know, that practice also, because that gives me at least like an additional incentive. I'd like to work with this, you know, because I don't want to stay five years old, you know. Yeah, like a bridge, you know, the pl plugging it in, that energy and then all of the energy which is frozen in the fridge. It's, it's like two kinds of uh, breathing, you know, happening and how much energy that costs, you know. And if that energy could be freed up, there would be a possibility to do something with that, you know, something good, something something conducive, you know. Mm -hmm. And, a, you know, community like the Dharma Collective or other communities, you know, that... That's what they're here for, you know. So that there is more, you know, a bit like support because it's it's hard to do it on your own, you know, because it's it needs a relationship also for that to unfreeze. Yeah, that's why monasteries, you know, are existing originally, you know, or families or whatever, like kind of communities you know who, who, and then they also they get, can get very dysfunctional as we know you know but I, it has good sides and not so good sides you know like everything else yeah so yeah and I, for those who are interested I have put at, at the t table where Noam sits some of these cards if anyone is interested that that's uh 
you know, because, you know, everywhere there's always Buddha statues, and I'm sure Naomi is going to have one of those frames, won't he? Because that's the foster mother of the Buddha, of the Buddha, you know, who brought up the Buddha when it said that his mother, his own mother died a few days after he was born, and she was his sister, uh, the, 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 her sister, the Buddha's mother's sister. And then she brought him up, and then she became one of the first bhikkhunis, you know, one of the first fully ordained nuns. And that's a drawing, you know, by a Sri Lankan artist, how she might have looked. And we have we had printed many, many, and I brought like a stack here. Because many people don't even know about her, you know. So thank you so much for coming, everyone. And I, uh, next month, um, I think another body is coming next month, not me, yeah. Mm -hmm, yeah. So, yeah, and then uh, I'm November, December, it's me then coming again. Yeah. So thank you for the invitation, Noam and Karen and San Francisco Dawa Collective and wish you all the best, you know, for your practice. And, you know, this is a really very special hub here in the middle of the city, you know, a very special place and wish you all the best, you know, for going ahead and, and uh, you know, starting to, you know, become more and more capable, you know, of meeting everything, you need in order to run this place. Okay, bye-bye.